Welcome to the fourth, uh, <laughs> for the fourth session of the 2011 Mini Medical Series, Mini Medical School Series. Our uh, first, uh, the two speakers for the first session, the uh, one uh, first of uh, will be Dr. Patch and Dellinger. Patch, that's what we all call him. Uh, Patch came to the, uh, he's a, pro a professor of surgery and uh, vice chair of the surgery department and uh, chief of general surgery. He came to the university in 1977, and as I remember, I met him at some time after that at Harborview. That, that's where he started working. And, uh, and when Harborview was built out of wood, I mean, that's how long ago Patch has been here. That's how long ago it's been. His clinical interests and research are in general surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and we're demonstrating laparoscopic uh, training in the back, GI, uh, gastrointestinal surgery, pancreatic and biliary disease, inflammatory bowel, col colorectal cancer, surgical uh, critical care, and uh, more recently, actually a pretty lifelong interest in bariatric surgery. Uh, Patch uh, has been a leader in the World Health Organization's campaign on sur safe surgery saves lives, in which the UW was one of, I think, of only eight schools or institutions across the world that started with this initiative, a pilot uh, project to improve safety of surgery worldwide. Um, not that he likes his grandkids. But you get the sense that he likes his grandkids, and you'll see that a lot. He loves these kids. Uh, he was the first recipient for the uh, Washington Health Foundation Excellence in Safety Award for his work uh, to prevent surgical infections, and has chaired the National Surgery Infection uh, Prevention Coalition. Patch came to us from Harvard, a slightly lesser school, but he succeeded anyway. <laughs> Uh, and did a residency at Beth Israel and a fellowship in infectious disease at Tufts and then came to the university. Uh, he lives in Seattle with his wife, Lisa, and his two kids, Kira and Seth, and he really is proud about his, uh, of his kids, his grandkids. Our second pe uh, speaker is Tom Varghese. Tom's an assistant professor for T uh, CT surgery at Harborview, uh, uh, the program director for the CT residency, uh, cardiothoracic residency, and director of the thoracic surgery at Harborview. Uh, his surgical interests deal with benign and malignant diseases of the chest, lungs, esophagus, mediastinum, that's the space that lives between the lungs. I went to look for pictures of Tom and his favorite happy moment about the Cubs because he's a Cubs fan. And you know, there are no pictures of him being happy about the Cubs. <laughs> it says something about the Cubs. And so, and then I went to look if there were some happy pictures about him and the success of the Bears. And oops, wrong again. The Steelers, or uh, Green Bay took that away from him. Anyway, uh, his research interests uh, include uh, surgical outcomes and quality of care. Uh, and how this might be advanced through simulation and some very innovative educational interventions. He's dedicated much of his time to training uh, residents and fellows and faculty uh, and is a core member of the simulation uh, family that we have here at the University of Washington. He came to uh, the university in 2007. He did his medical school training in, uh, oh, he does, he does, we have some pictures from the Cubs. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from the Government Medical College in uh, Kerala, India. He had general residency at Northwestern in Chicago, CT training surgery at the University of Michigan, and then a transplant fellowship at Northwestern. Tom will be, uh, uh, Patch will be uh, speaking about uh, teamwork, communication, and safety in the operating room. Tom will be speaking about uh, never events, and hopefully by the end of your talk, his talk, you will know what a never event really is. Uh, Tom is joined here by his wife, a Angel, and his daughter, Alyssa, who's 12, and Tommy, who's 7. And you're going to enjoy both of these speakers very much and what they bring to you in a safe uh, uh, transverse through surgery. Tom? Good evening. That was actually the nicest introduction Brian's ever given for me in my, in my life, so I, I want to first off thank him for being kind to me. 
Uh, we're we're going to be talking tonight about some patient safety metrics, and uh, specifically, as uh, uh, Dr. Ross had alluded to, about this concept of never events. And when we talk about patient safety, uh, essentially, in any type of complex environment, such as healthcare, there are multiple pieces that make up that environment. And patient safety is exactly the same things. Uh, there's multiple intricate connecting pieces, and if there's an error or a misstep in any of these different pieces, the whole thing sort of breaks down. And this was the startling uh, report that came out in November of 1999. That is, the Institute of Medicine came out with a report uh, termed to err as human. And in that, what they predicted, uh, they estimated that 98,000 deaths per year occur in the United States as a re direct result of adverse events. And to put that concept of that number of 100,000 uh, in perspective, if you think about the causes of death per year with heart, uh, people dying from heart disease being number one and cancer number two, and if people dying from motor vehicle accidents and everything being about number five, people dying from motor vehicle accidents total about 112,000 per year. And so 100,000 deaths per year is not a small number. And obviously for all of us in the care of patients, uh, you know, any one death is one too many. And so when the report looked further, they found out that 72% of those errors occurred as a direct result of communication breakdowns. And so when we're going forward, uh, this concept of never events essentially came up in 2001. That is, uh, first, JCO, as uh, the initials stand for the Joint Commission of Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, they uh, go around the country and they sort of, you know, take a look at the structure of healthcare organizations. And they see if everybody's ducks are in a roll. And what they have is this concept called sentinel events. These are sort of events whereby if any one of these things happen, that's sort of a, an earmark or you know, a warning sign that you know, something bad is going on. And when they looked at their categories from 1985 to 2005, they found out that when a sentinel event or a bad outcome happened, the vast majority of it occurred as a result of a communication breakdown. And in 2001, Ken Kaiser, who was the CEO of the National Quality Forum, termed this a concept of never event. And a never event, in essence, is a bad or an adverse event that should ideally never happen in the care of a patient. And when you go further in terms of categories of never events, they really break down into six different categories. Uh, the first uh, you know, listed up there is surgical, but the, uh, the other events, uh, categories occur in product or device malfunctions, patient protection categories, errors in care management, environmental breakdowns, and criminal acts uh, that occur in the setting of a healthcare uh, organization. Going down the list further, this is an extensive list. Initially in 2001, they came up with 26 never events uh, that got expanded to 28. And when you're going down the different events and everything, you can see that underneath each of the different six categories, there's further events. For example, let's take, for example, the first category that is surgical events. So surgery performed on the wrong part of the body. That is, somebody comes in for a procedure on the left leg, and for whatever reason, the patient ended up getting an operation on the right leg. Um, surgery performed on the wrong patient. You know, uh, it, it, a wrong surgical procedure performed on the patient. Patient's meant to have surgery, but they didn't get the surgery that they signed up for. Oh, or an unintended retention of a foreign object. This could be an instrument, this could be a sponge, something left behind in a patient at the end of surgery. And then uh, an intraoperative or immediately post-operative death. That is obviously, when you're taking care of a patient, you're taking to the operating room, the goal is obviously to, for that patient to have the procedure performed, but also maintain a quality of life afterwards. You know, dying, of course, doesn't tie into that concept. And so you can see that under each, each category, there are different uh, listed events, um, environmental events and criminal events being the fifth and sixth categories. When you go further, every single state uh, now mandates reporting of these never events. So if a healthcare organization has any of these events happen, they get reported to the, uh, the Department of Health for that prospective state. And many states have now adopted public reporting of these. Washington State is no different uh, than any other states. And so you can go onto this website on the Department of Health uh, for Washington State, and you can literally look up every single hospital or healthcare organization in the state 
w regarding their performance on adverse events. This is good, and there's some bad parts about it too. It's good in the terms it gets people talking about this. It, it uh, um, you know, inspires people to make amends and try to prevent these events from happening. There is a bad element into it because the thing is, is that there's sometimes not the concept of why that happened. You know, so uh, I'll give you an example. For example, um, if a patient lies in bed for a long period of time, they can develop what's called a pressure ulcer. That is a breakdown in their skin uh, in the dependent areas of their body. Well, it, you're, you're absolutely correct. A normal, healthy person who's in the hospital should never have a pressure ulcer. But what happens if that patient uh, came in after a trauma and um, had multi-system organ failure and all the healthcare workers, you know, spent an enormous amount of time and effort trying to save this person's life and as a result they were too critically unstable to move to prevent that pressure ulcer from happening, yet they ended up developing the pressure ulcer. Um, so that type of, uh, you know, context or description and everything oftentimes are not reported in real time in these public reported. But for the most part, the goal should be that none of these uh, never events should ever occur and that methods should be taken to prevent them from happening. We're going to go forward in the rest of the portion of my talk in terms of focusing on one particular uh, adverse event or never event, that is leaving behind an object at the end of surgery, a so-called retained foreign object. Nationwide, uh, a busy tertiary care center that is, averages approximately one retained foreign object per year. That is, is, if you look at the breakdown, that is one retained foreign object for every 15,000 cases uh, that a hospital performs. Obviously, that's one too many. You know, that, there should be zero. You know, nobody expects to go in, have an operation at the end, have something left behind at, them at, at the end of the case. And uh, oftentimes, the hospitals, when they try to address this particular problem, they'll combine and get the leadership together, get surgeons together, and form what's called a task force. And really the goals of the task force at that point is you're trying to investigate the reasons why this happened. Uh, are there things in place that sort of lend uh, itself for this particular problem for happening? And what are the methods to try and prevent it? So you try to identify the risk factors, identify ways to prevent it, and then you want to come up with a plan. A plan that consists of immediate action steps and for ongoing review as it's going to be an ongoing process. And when you look at the review, you, you look at the literature, look at what are the best patient safety practices, and you also take a look at what are the policies and procedures in place at that healthcare organization to try and prevent that problem from happening in the first place. One of the most cited articles for this particular problem was uh, written by Dr. Atul Gawande and, and the authors, in, uh, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. And so what they did in this particular study was they looked at uh, those insurance claims where retained foreign objects occurred, um, and then they went back and tried to figure out were there predictive methods of, or things in place that led, lend itself to having the problem happen in the first place. And so a lot of things are as you expected, unexpected emergent operations, you know, a lot of things going on at the same time. Uh, situations where counts were not being done. Counts mean, meaning that laparotomy sponges or instruments, the counts usually before a case, all those things are itemized and accounted for before the start of the procedure. But you can imagine if a patient comes in emergently in, people are trying to scramble around trying to do their best for the patient and sometimes the counts can't occur. Um, in large patients where, um, you know, x-rays are done at the end of the case to try to make sure that all the, there's nothing left behind, but somehow the x-rays don't capture the entire patient and, and so on. But the problem what happens with studies like this is, is these are the studies of cases that we know about. And we know that sometimes there may be situations out there where a patient may have had an object left behind and they don't know about it. Uh, now that's not to say that you know, there are millions of patients out there that have this particular problem, but it's just one of those things that sometimes studies like this it, it has a tough time really trying to capture exactly what the magnitude of the problem is. The state of Minnesota is another state where they publicly report uh, retained foreign objects and other never events. And when you look at their website, they have this particular graph where they find out that half the time the problem happened as a result of not following the rules or policies and procedures that were already in place at that hospital uh, aimed at trying to prevent it. 
Uh, and then the other big category a quarter of the time was communication breakdown. That's what led to the retained foreign object happening in the first place. And so when you look at all the different types of literature out there, the topmost thing is distractions. Um, we're in the age of information overload, uh, as, as everybody knows. You know, everybody walks around with their smartphones, they're bombarded with emails all the time. Con the Consumer Reports did a fascinating study about three years ago where they tried to test what the reaction time for drivers were in terms of, you know, if you're driving along and then they're told to brake and then, you know, but they did it under different settings. So they did a normal driver, a un normal unimpaired driver, a driver who was legally drunk, a driver who was sleep deprived or fatigued, and the, the last category was a driver who was texting while driving. And needless to say, the person who performed the worst was the person who was texting while driving. So distractions obviously play a big thing. Lack of clear and concise communication. Mistakes during the count. As I said, most times before you do a procedure, you have itemized the list of uh, items that are going to be used during the case and account for them at the end of the case. And then this last category, which is the fear of speaking up. Um, surgery is a very hierarchical system. You know, we surgeons, we love to believe that, you know, we're, you know, we're, uh, you know, al almighty, and sometimes we put up with anesthesiologists like Dr. Ross over here. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, this is a team sport. You know, every single member in that operating room is equally accountable for patient safety. When you look at the review of best patient safety practices, Really, you find a couple of different themes. You know, senior leadership that it, uh, has identified patient safety champions. Uh, and they're not just physicians. They're nurses, anesthesiologists. Every single per uh, team member should have a patient safety champion. Uh, a designated coordinator to implement patient safety practices. These coordinators will be, uh, really, the goal would be to, you know, uh, be really assign intermittent, uh, you know, team practice sessions, staff education, and so forth. Real-time documentation, if there's a problem, document the problem right away. Do audits. And then senior leadership has set clear ex expectations. And really we go back to this word that you see popping up uh, over and over again, policies and code of conduct checklists, which uh, Dr. Dellinger will be going more into detail about in timeouts. And so I I've mentioned this term a number of times, what is a policy and what is culture? And uh, you know, obviously they're Tough words to define, but I think that the best story that I have that really comes back to is I've got a picture of a bunch of gorillas. And so this is a famous story. Nobody really knows if it happened or not. But apparently, a number of years ago, the London Zoo had an experiment. And so in their enclosure of gorillas, they set aside some food, a, a pile of bananas. And every time one gorilla went towards a pile of bananas, uh, a jet of uh, water came from a hose and knocked the gorilla back. Well, pretty soon the gorillas start realizing, wait a minute, if I start going towards that food, I'm going to get hit with a, uh, a jet of water. And so what the one, they had in the enclosure one gorilla. And so then they ad kept adding more gorillas to that enclosure. When the second gorilla went in, the second gorilla started going towards the food. But one of the things that they noticed was that the first gorilla tried to prevent that gorilla from going towards that uh, banana. And so they kept doing this experiment, and after a while, they decided, okay, we're, we're done studying gorillas, so we're not going to do this experiment anymore. Well, an amazing thing happened. What they found is, is that over the years, even though the original set of gorillas that participated in the experiment were no longer part of the experiment, they still found the same behavior. That is, is that as more and more gorillas were introduced, each and every single time somebody went towards the banana, the other gorillas sort of pulled them back and prevented them from going. And so I like to use that story to explain that's exactly what a policy is. A policy is something that comes into play as a result of a set of circumstances that occur at that particular time. And while that experiment or that particular set of circumstances occurs, the policy makes absolute sense. But what happens is, is that if you don't do an ongoing revisit or realize why is this policy in place, if you don't keep thinking about it and keep trying to review it, what ends up happening is exactly what happens to the new gorillas. That is the same behavior, the same policy keeps getting perpetuated over time and nobody really knows why the policy existed in the first place. And so when we talk about ongoing review of policies, that's exactly what I think what you talk about. And that type of behavior is this, in essence culture. And so when you try to change culture, you try to break things down to 
Why does that type set of behavior happen in the first place? And then try to go to the root of that cause and then try to change. And so other effective strategies, building awareness of the problem. So if an institution has a retained foreign body problem, let everybody know about it. You know, get help, you know, tell everybody. You know, all, all people who are involved in healthcare come to work every single day for the benefit of patients. I mean, I think that's a privilege that each and every one of us have. And, uh, you know, if there's a problem, people should know about it. Recognizing the role that each and every single team member in the operating room plays in trying to uh, prevent this problem. And then we come to this so-called universal checklisting process. That is, is that when you do standardized counts, that you create a momentary pause. That is, in this high complex environment, such as the operating room, where a lot of things are going on, you take a moment and say, is everything going okay? Do we, have, uh, do we know where all our instruments are? Do we know where all our sponges are? Uh, is everybody on the same page? Just taking a pause and everything and getting everybody involved in, in that process. Um, there's this concept called assume it is wrong. That is, prove to yourself that all, all the instruments and sponges and everything are, are actually there. And then for doing a preliminary count, you know, you're getting ready to finish up the case, do a quick count, making sure you have all your instruments and sponges, and then at the end of the case, again, do another count. Now, the attributes of a surgical safety checklist, and as I said, Dr. Dollinger is going to go into more into detail, is, is that a checklist is not just a list of items and you just read off and that's the end of it. You know, it's got to, every single thing on that checklist has to be supported by evidence, and you've got to have a promote, promote adherence to this sort of safety practice. And so, really, this sentence is the key thing. It helps people to do all the right things on all patients all the time. What are methods by which you can really ensure that you know, people do good safety practices and, and adhere to checklists? There's this concept called red rules, and that is these red rules are essentially rules that are in place, and this next slide really goes into it. What is a red rule? It's an act that has the highest level of risk or consequence to safety, if not performed exactly uh, that way each and every single time. And the red essentially designates the highest priority for exact compliance. And also red designates, you know, like a stop sign, that is, is that if that action doesn't happen, you got to stop what you're doing and make and find out why did that action not occur. Um, other common themes, uh, usually when you start addressing these problems, you start finding out that you can take care of the sponge counts initially, but then there's always going to be other issues also, such as equipment issues like we talked about. So what are examples of real-time reporting? Um, there are reports that are generated at the end of every single operating room case. That is, is that these are called PSN or patient safety network reports. And you can also do audits to see if people are actually doing checklists. And so one example is in fiscal year 2010, um, the UHC consortium or the University Health Consortium is a list of academic programs across the country. And when you look at the different type of categories of where problems occurred, it's really this first category, which essentially, I'll read it out, it says errors related to procedure, treatment, and tests, that is, wrong counts. Uh, that's really the biggest category in everything that happens. But you can still see there are other categories, you know, equipment issues and so forth. Audits, uh, our uh, surgical checklist, as uh, Dr. Dellinger is going to go into, is called the SCOPE checklist. Um, you know, SCOPE is the Surgical Care and Outcomes Assessment Program, where they find in this checklist there are three different uh, divisions. And you can then, once you start doing audits, you can start tracking to see what the completion rates are. And you can see that, uh, you know, in this particular year, you know, the three different parts, you can see that once you start doing the audit process in January 2010, you, by May, you can see that, everybody's doing the checklist all the different times. And in fact, as of currently right now, in our organization, it's 100% completion rate right now. And so this is the type of process that you end up going. That is, you start introducing audits, you start building awareness of the problem, and you start seeing uh, metrics that reflect the way uh, towards uh, accomplishing a goal to preventing the retained foreign object. Visual aids are things to help sort of doing the counts. That is, is that this is uh, Dr. Verna Gibbs is, uh, is, a, is a surgeon at the University of California, San Francisco, who's built up these types of visual aids. That is to say, you know, remember one, two, three, see all these sponges and everything that are actually used. And these are things that sort of help out. Um, in closing, I'm going to say that this is a book called The Influencer. And um, uh, if you get a chance when you go home tonight, if you go to uh, YouTube and you do type in influencer, there's a fascinating um, teaching video on there that talks about 
uh, little kids and how they, uh, people are trying to teach them hand hygiene. But essentially, one of the key take-home points of this book uh, is the fact that anytime that you're trying to influence or change behavior or change culture, you got to approach this problem in multiple different ways. You can't just do it w one, one specific way. You can't just state and say that everybody has to do this and mandate that and expect 100% compliance. You got to do, you know, do it in different ways. Uh, as we just showed you in terms of the common themes from the literature, you know, identifying patient safety champions, doing audits, building awareness of the problem, doing real-time reports. Those are the different ways that you end up going by changing the culture and you know, making sure that you just don't end up as a bunch of gorillas. <laughs> um, I'm going to, uh, at this point, I'm going to turn my talk over to Dr. Dellinger, who's going to go on and to describe some fascinating details about a phenomenal project that occurred internationally uh, centering on the surgical safety checklist. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So I'm going to be talking about the role of teamwork, and communication, and checklists in the operating room. And I think this follows very nicely from what Tom just told you. And there was a fascinating study done by, back in 2006 by a surgeon at Johns Hopkins who went and asked anesthesiologists whether they were good team workers in the OR and whether the nurses were and the surgeons were. And they asked each of the groups whether they were good team workers and how good the other teams were. And this is a complicated slide, and we don't have time to spend a lot of time on it. But basically, each group rated their own teamwork much better than anyone else rated their teamwork. <laughs> And surgeons thought everyone else were great team workers, and most of the other people had much lower opinions of the surgical teamwork, <laughs> as uh, Tom has sort of indicated. And I think one of the important changes that we've been seeing over the last few years is to recognize the importance of the role the surgeon plays in the operating room, but the importance of the teamwork, and the fact that the surgeon's role only works if everyone else on the team is fully involved and an equal team player. This slide uh, looks at, um, they sent social scientists into the operating room and they observed how well there was communication between surgeons and everyone else. And to oversimplify it, on the left hand side of the slide there's poor communication and high complication rates and on the right hand part of the slide there's good communication and lower com complication rates. So it's very clear from this kind of work that better communication in the operating room leads to fewer complications. Um, I was privileged a few years ago to work in a project at the World Health Organization uh, that was uh, part of a larger uh, process called World Alliance for Patient Surgery, focusing on surgery issues. And the team that was uh, leading this uh, formulated 10 objectives for safe surgery. That the surgeon and the team will operate on the correct patient at the correct site, as Tom has discussed already, that we will use methods known to prevent harm from anesthetics while protecting the patient from pain, recognize and effectively prepare for life-threatening loss of breathing and oxygenation, recognize and prepare for blood loss, avoid inducing adverse events and allergies, consistently use methods known to reduce the risk of infection, prevent the retention of instruments and foreign objects, secure and identify all surgical specimens. Imagine having an important procedure in a biopsy and then having the biopsy lost so the information is gone. Effectively communicate and exchange, excuse me, exchange information for the safe conduct of the information and develop surveillance so that we can know what our outcomes are. And as part of this, uh, the uh, project decided to develop a checklist for using in the operating room. And the advantages of a checklist are that it can be customized to local settings and needs. And I'll show you some examples of that. It can be deployed in an incremental fashion. It's not all or none. You can sort of work your way into this. It is supported by scientific evidence, which I will show you. It has been evaluated in diverse settings around the world. I'll show you that. 
It can help to ensure adherence to established safety practices, and it requires actually very few resources to implement this, other than time and effort from people. This is an overview of the first World Health Organization surgical safety checklist which developed. And I point to the part at the bottom that says this checklist is not intended to be comprehensive. Additions and modifications to fit local practice are encouraged. WHO encourages local institutions to modify the list to address local needs. And as an example, one of the items on the checklist was that anesthesia machine safety checks should be done. Now, there are parts of the world where this was not routine practice when we developed the checklist. But in the United States, anesthesia professionals actually led the way on safety in the operating room, and they developed checklists for the specific anesthesia-related parts of an operative procedure decades before surgeons got on board and figured out that this was important as well. And I can remember specifically that when I was training in surgery back in the 1970s and would speak to my patients about the risk of the operation and the risk of the anesthetic, I quoted anesthetic risks which were 10 times higher than anesthetic risks are today because the anesthesia profession developed checklists and safety checks that went into everything that they do at least in, in, our, in our setting in the US and in other developed countries. And so as a result, one of the things we did when we brought the checklist to Seattle after the initial study was to remove the point on, this, on the checklist asking if the anesthesiologist had been doing the anesthesia machine safety check. They'd been doing it for decades. So we put other things on the checklist that we thought needed to be done here in the US that that weren't on the checklist that was trying to get the biggest bang for the buck in other parts of the world. Pulse oximeter is something that measures how well the oxygen is getting from the anesthesia machine to your finger or to other parts of your body. I haven't seen an operation done in this city without a pulse oximeter for over 20 years. So we took that off the checklist so we could put other things on. Nursing team has checked the sterility indicator. It's very important for the instruments to be sterile. For 20 years, I've been watching nurses check the sterility indicator and send instruments back to the central core and request a new set if they found that the indicator wasn't proper. So we knew that was something we didn't need to spend extra time on. This checklist was piloted in eight cities around the world, and we were very privileged to be able to be one of those eight cities. And um, prior to that, I had been involved in discussions with uh, my general surgical group about what we called briefings and debriefings for operations. That is to get the nursing team, the anesthesia team, the surgical team at the beginning of the case and just talk very briefly, not, not a long meeting, talk about what the patient's issues are, what we intend to accomplish with the operation, and what problems might develop, and is everyone in the room ready? And then at the end of the case, discuss how things went, and what we expect the recovery to be, and what we should do perhaps differently for this patient from other patients because of special circumstances. It's hard to get new things introduced in the operating room. Everyone agreed it was a good idea, but we hadn't quite gotten there. And then when this checklist came up, I saw that as a way to institutionalize briefings and debriefings, and I volunteered us to be one of the uh, primary sites in the first uh, trial of this, and we were very fortunate to be chosen. Now, I want to talk a little bit about another thing that Tom's also mentioned, SCOPE, or the Surgical Care Outcomes Assessment Program. This is a voluntary collaborative of surgeons throughout Washington states. It's a grassroots organization which now involves all but one or two hospitals throughout the entire state. Surgeons got together and said, what are the things we should be measuring what kinds of things would we like to see that are being done or measure how well they're being done and measure the outcomes for surgical patients in the state of Washington? We began by following very closely all patients having operations for colon and rectal operations, for bariatric operations to deal with severe obesity, having an appendectomy, or having vascular operations. 
we're in the process of developing, that is, other people are in the process of developing a model for pediatric surgery. What we do is we collect information on these patients. What was done at the time of the operation, before the operation, after the operation, and what happened? What kind of results did we get? And we give that information back to each hospital on a quarterly basis. We let them know the results for their own hospital. We show them the results for all other hospitals not identified by name and let them see how they're doing in comparison to everyone else. Here's an example. How many patients who have a colon operation need another operation or another intervention afterwards? You can see that the incidence of needing another operation ranges from a high of 15% to a low of 1 or 2% throughout the state of Washington. The average is 4%. So there's huge variations. And, you know, we've got hospitals A through P here. If you're part of SCOPE, you would get this report, and you would know if you were hospital A with an average result or hospital B with a very high result. Here are the data for keeping patients warm during their operation. You can see some hospitals keep their patients warm 100% of the time. Some, patient, some hospitals know more than about 60% of the time. And I should say that these, you can see, these are data from 2006, 2007, and I think a lot of these results are better. And, and over time, hospitals have been bringing themselves back up and closer to the average. But these are, these are data from those years. Here's whether patients with diabetes had their blood sugar checked while they were having an operation. You can see it goes from as low as 35% up to 95% of the time. Here's how often they got the appropriate blood thinners to prevent blood clots that is one of the complications that it can occur after an operation. Here's how often they got a medication called beta blockers, which if you are receiving it before your operation, it's important to continue after the operation to reduce heart problems. This shows between the first quarter of 2006 and the second quarter of 2007, the average improvement in the delivery of proper preventive measures for blood clots suffered around the time of an operation. This shows the improvement in accuracy of x-rays and ultrasound exams done to look for a diagnosis of appendicitis when a patient comes to the emergency room with that as a possible diagnosis. This shows the falling rate of reoperations for colon operations in the state of Washington and scope hospitals over time as we fed this information back to hospitals and the hospitals that were higher than other ones said, whoa, what are we doing? How can we change this so that we can get in line with other hospitals in the state? This shows the reduction in the number of patients having operations for appendicitis who it was found out did not have appendicitis after the operation was done. Actually, the average within the United States is above 10%, and it's much lower than that now for scope hospitals in the uh, state of Washington. So we introduced the checklist into our operating room here at the University of Washington and then later took it to scope hospitals throughout the state of Washington. And one of the things we did is we asked people who work in the operating rooms their attitudes about safety. And you can see one of the things we asked them is, uh, would you feel safe as a patient here? And you can see that most people did feel as though they would be pretty safe as a patient in their operating room. And most people thought it was important to have a briefing before the operation. And most people thought that they were encouraged to report concerns, but it's kind of low before we introduce the checklist, under 80%, up to 90% afterwards, which I, I hope means that the checklist encouraged people to realize that it's important to report their concerns. Nevertheless, a disturbing one in five persons in the operating room felt that it was difficult to speak up and to express their concerns if they perceived a problem. And this has to do with the historical hierarchy in the operating room that uh, Tom has already mentioned, which has its roles in certain settings but can lead to a failure to speak up. Were the doctors and nurses a good team? Only half said so before the checklist and only 65% after. Better but not good enough. 
and about one in six patients thought that they observed frequent disregarding of the rules. I assume they mean they saw someone else disregarding the rules. <laughs> Afterwards, we asked people if they found that the checklist was easy to use, and a little over half did. Whether it improved OR safety, 60. Whether it took a long time to complete, one in five or one in four. But look at this. Would I want the checklist used if I were having an operation? Even those who didn't seem to think it, it was so easy to use or improved OR safety would like it for themselves. And let me tell you, if a doc wants something for himself, you probably want it for yourself too. <laughs> there are other data. Uh, this study, uh, done in a series of hospitals in uh, California, looked at what they call the behavioral marker risk index, which again, had people observe in the operating room and see whether, whether the different professionals were briefing one another, whether there was good information sharing, whether there was inquiry uh, when things were unclear, and whether there was vigilance. And they showed that there was a dramatic increase in complications and deaths when there was not good behavioral markers. Um, after uh, the initial uh, checklist, we, which we introduced here in this hospital in March 2008, we began with in general surgery. When it was a success in general surgery, we broke it out to all uh, surgical disciplines in the hospital. We went around and talked to every surgical discipline, introduced the checklist. We made posters two by three feet. We put it up in the a poster in every OR. We made a training video, which if you're interested, you can go to the SCOPE website and you can see a 10-minute training video illustrating how to use the checklist. It was done in ISIS, and you'll hear more about ISIS in uh, Dr. Ross's talk. This is the first checklist. Uh, it's changed a few times since then because we, we adapt it over time as we see areas where we could improve matters. And this shows one of the surgeons in my uh, group looking over her patient at the checklist and reading off the points in order to, uh, to go over this. This shows the circulating nurse in the operating room looking at the patient's identification and the consent form, making sure that the operation the patient consented to is the one that the surgeon plans to do, that we have the right patient, that we're doing the right operation, and so on as we go down the list. We timed people, and it took an average of just over two minutes to do the checklist at the beginning of each operation. We interviewed people after we introduced it. This is what a nurse said. I like the checklist. It makes everyone stop for a few minutes, pay more attention before the case. Now doing the regular time out seems inadequate. The Joint Commission had required that we stop before we do an operation and make sure we had the right patient and we were doing the right operation. But the checklist has a lot more on it, and I'll show you what's on the checklist in a minute. Now, there are challenges, of course. First of all, getting it institutionalized, getting people used to it, getting them to change behavior, because this is something they hadn't been doing before, getting it in every OR, getting it in every case, supporting the culture change especially getting the surgeons to buy in because we're sort of a cantankerous, hidebound uh, uh, group that, that is used to the way things used to be done. We wanted to streamline the checklist, if possible, to meet the needs of individual hospitals and specialties. And then the end, we had more luck getting everybody to do the checklist at the beginning than getting them at the end of the case to take some time when everyone wants to rush off and do whatever they have to do and get the patient to the recovery room. We want to say, hang on a minute. We just did a very important thing. What's the next step in this patient's recovery? What are the information that we need to exchange to make sure that we don't introduce a complication right after the operation happens? So we had expanded the WHO checklist to include important, important metrics that we had learned through the process and scope that I've already illustrated was not being done the same way in every hospital every time. And we started a checklist coalition which worked on getting throughout the year of 2009 to 2010 getting the checklist into every OR in the, in the state. We got the assistance of the Washington State Hospital Association of many of the big third-party payers like Aetna and Uniform Plan in the, in the state. 
We got support from uh, employers like Boeing. We got a number of nonprofit organizations to work with us. And by the end of 2009, we had every hospital telling us that they had implemented the surgical safety checklist in their ORs. We haven't gone to every OR to watch it happen and make sure we know the quality, but at least it is there in every hospital. Now, this is an example of the checklist that I'm using these days when I do a case. And I want to emphasize, we start out, each person introduces him or herself by name and role. And I start it, we, we ask the surgeon to sort of start it because the surgeon is kind of the traditional leader in the OR. So I say, hi, I'm Patch, I'm the surgeon today. And then I point to my assistant who introduces him or herself and then the circulating nurse, the scrub nurse, the anesthesiologist, an anesthesia tech or a medical assistant if they're in the room. Anyone in the room introduces themselves. And then we go around and, and I say, now let's introduce the patient. And we make sure we've got the right patient and we're doing the right procedure. And then we go down through here. And then here at the bottom we say, any questions or issues from any team member, you must speak up at any time in the procedure if you observe something or you have a concern about what's going on. The airline industry knowed, found out years ago that planes crashed because co-pilots or stewardesses or mechanics were afraid to speak up to the all-powerful captain. And the same kind of thing can happen if people in the OR are afraid to speak up to the surgeon. So we emphasize the importance of anyone in the OR bringing up any concerns. And then we turn to the nursing team and we say, nursing team, what do you, do you have any concerns? Do you have the equipment you need? How are we going to manage the sharp instruments so we don't injure one another while we're doing these cases? We don't cut or stick a needle into somebody else because it's coming across the field when it's not expected. And then we ask the anesthesia team, what are your concerns? Was there any problem getting the tube into the patient's windpipe? Does this patient need any special medications? Are there any allergies we need to be concerned about? And then we go on. We ask, did the patient get an antibiotic? It's another whole discussion, but giving an antibiotic just before an operation reduces the risk of infection. Is the patient warm? Are we doing something to keep the patient warm? If the patient stays warm during an operation, the risk of infection and other complications is lower. When you get an anesthetic, your body rapidly cools off unless we do something actively to warm you. If you're diabetic, did we check your blood sugars? And if the operation is going to be long, do we have a plan for when we need to give another dose of antibiotics in order to prevent infection? Then at the end of the operation, once the skin is closed or nearly closed and basically we're just about done, we have what we call scope three. When we talk about this is the debrief and we, we confirm that the, all the needles, the sponges and the instruments are correct, that there's nothing, everything that should be on the table is on the table and none of it is in the patient. And we ask the nursing team to show the surgeon all the sponges. So there's supposed to be 20 sponges. Show them to me in the bag. And Tom showed you a, a, a picture of the bags holding the sponges. So it's very easy to see where they are. What is the name of this procedure? How are we going to write it in the chart? What is, is the spe Did we take a specimen on this patient? Does it have a proper label on it? Do we have the right instructions so the right tests will be done on the specimen? Are there any equipment issues? If there was an equipment issue, if something didn't work, what are we going to do about it so we don't run into that in our next case? And then the surgeon and the anesthesia team talk about what are the key concerns for patient recovery. And they go over how will the patient be monitored, what medications are needed, is there anything special for this patient different from other patients? So when we did the first checklist, we uh, went to the eight hospitals that were involved in this process and we, um, we looked at over 3,700 patients before there was any checklist introduced and almost 4,000 patients afterwards. And the rate of surgical site infections, that's infections in the incision, was reduced almost to half. The unplanned return to the operating rooms went from 2.5% to under 2%. Any complications reduced from 11 to 7%, and deaths were cut almost in half. 
Now, there were skeptics. They said, well, you know, you didn't randomize patients to get the checklist or not get the checklist, and you did it before and after, and maybe other things changed besides. You know what? You had those undeveloped countries. You had the Philippines. You had Tanzania. You had India. You had Jordan. Probably all of the benefits came from those countries. You know, it wasn't England and Canada and the US. Nah. They said, you know, this is a waste of time. We don't want to bother with this. We didn't believe that, but very nicely, just in January, uh, sorry, just in the fall of this year, another checklist paper was published from the Netherlands. Now, I want to show of hands, how many think the Netherlands is an undeveloped country? <laughs> ha. <laughs> I got one back there. <laughs> anyway. In the Netherlands, they went to very high-performing high hospitals, and they, they introduced a checklist, and they, they had an additional item that we did not have here, which is they, they took a group of high-performing hospitals where they introduced the checklist, and another group of similar high-performing hospitals where they did not introduce the checklist. They followed them all for three or four months, and then they introduced the checklist in some of the hospitals and followed, again, all of the hospitals with and without the checklist for several months. In the hospitals where the checklist was introduced, infections went from 3.8% to 2.7, complications from 27 to 17, um, and the number of complications per 100 patients, some patients had more than one, any patient with a complication from 15% to 11% and deaths, again, cut almost in half the same numbers as from the first study. But no changes occurred in the hospitals where they had not introduced the checklist in the same country observed over the same time, a very strong study. In addition, they had a bit longer and more complicated checklist than we had used here and they kept track of how many items on the checklist were done. In hospitals that did more than the average portion of the checklist, complications were 4% lower than hospitals that did less than the average complete checklist. So there were clearly there was a dose response effect here showing a very clear uh, response to the checklist. Uh, I got this slide from a friend of mine in Toronto, which was one of the other eight sites that piloted the WHO checklist. And this pilot says, the estimate that up to 23,000 people died in Canadian hospitals because of preventable adverse events is staggering. Checklists in aviation have been in use pretty well since the Wright brothers. Actually, it was a bit after the Wright brothers, but nevertheless, decades before surgery. One wonders whether such checklists would have been introduced much earlier in medicine if surgeons shared the fate of their patients as pilots share that of their passengers. <laughs> I've heard a pilot say, I never worry about the passengers in the back. I worry about me getting safely to the next airport. <laughs> In addition, more recent work, this, this is a very nice study that was done in Veterans Administration hospitals throughout the nation. They went, uh, they introduced a formal program of what they called team training. And they actually closed their operating rooms for a full day and they brought all the anesthesiologists, all the nurses, all the surgeons, and the people who support the work in the OR, the assistants and other people, and they brought them into a room together and they talked about how you communicate effectively with one another, how if you're a lowly student nurse, you tell an exalted professor surgeon that you're worried about something he's about to do to his patient. And they showed that over time with team training, they reduced post-operative deaths by improving teamwork and communication in the operating room. And I I'm happy to say that we're involved in an active program of team training, step by step, uh, group by group, uh, in our own medical center uh, for this reason. If you'd like to get more information about SCOPE, the Surgical Care Outcomes Assessment Program that both Tom Varghese and I have talked about, you can get it. The easiest way to get to it is www.scope.org. And um, 
and at that site, you can find uh, up-to-date data on what SCOPE is doing in hospitals in the state of Washington, and you can see the training video that the University Medical Center made for uh, introducing the checklist. Thank you very much. So the idea that if we learn to talk to each other correctly, we can save patients' lives, novel concept, and to use a simple thing like a checklist. But it looks like it takes a long time, but it doesn't. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes to do this whole checklist. At $63 a minute in the operating room, it's pretty good pay for decreasing uh, deaths and mortalities. Mm -hmm.